Spirit of God, teach me what Greg cannot, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, when I was a youngster, I, uh, you know, most of you probably know I've been going to church my whole life. Thanks to God and that woman right there. I've been going to church my whole life. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, growing up, though, you know, going to church, I always thought those people up there preaching, they got it all together. I mean, they're up here telling us all this truth, and they know a lot, and they must have it all together. And uh, it wasn't until I became one that I realized how untrue that was. You know, if I could only teach you about the things that I had together, I just wouldn't be able to teach you that much. (laughs) I mean, mean, you know, would God limit you to the things that I had together? You know, like, really? No, of course not. And so, uh, you know, I know um, coming up here, and I don't want, um, you know, I don't want you to have the same misconceptions about life that, you know, if if we're up here sharing this, these, uh, what I'm sharing with you are my struggles, not the things that I have put together, but the things that I'm figuring out and trying to figure out. And so uh, God is gracious, amen? And none of us have this all figured out, and none of us are even close. But we move on together, amen? We're going to start this morning in Ephesians, I believe it's chapter 5. Yes, Ephesians chapter 5. Um, how many of you know that God is real? Yeah. Hey Amen. You believe God's real? Yeah. You know who else is real? The devil. We're not as energetic about that one. <laughs> and that's not near as exciting. However, it's, uh, it's something that we need to know. I recall a time when uh, Jesus said in his word, John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came to give you life and give it to you abundantly. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. There is a thief in your life that wants to steal, to kill, and destroy you. There's another time that Jesus came to Peter and he said, Peter, I've got some bad news. The devil has desired to have you. And he wants to sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith would not fail you and that after you're converted, that you would strengthen your brethren. Then the apostle Peter later on, as he's writing a letter to the churches, He tells the churches, he says, I want you to be sober. I want you to be aware. I want you to live cautiously because your enemy, the devil, walks about as a lion seeking whom he may devour. And so we have these testimonies from Jesus. We have these testimonies from Peter. And as you'll see this morning, we have these testimonies from Paul that there is a real enemy out there trying to destroy your life. They wants to destroy what you've got going on. And so when we think about that, we think, oh man, the devil wants to destroy my life. But I'm here to tell you this morning, it may not be in the traditional senses that you've always thought. Because there's one thing about the devil uh, that he's really good at his job is that he's really subtle. And the devil, he wants to do the kind of destroying of your life to where you just wake up one day and go, what happened? To where you wake up one day and you you can't identify where it went wrong. You can't identify what happened. All you know is that your life's been destroyed. That's the kind of enemy that you have. One that is subtle. One that you don't see coming. And so uh, we're going to talk about that this morning. Because it's important that we know and we're aware of our enemy. Who our enemy is and what his tactics are. So we're going to begin this morning in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. It says this, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Let me just clean that up and say it in a language that I speak. See then that you walk cautiously, 
not as stupid, but as smart. <laughs> uh, see then that you walk cautiously. See then as you go through life that you walk cautiously, knowing, you know what, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't spend a lot of my life walking cautiously. There's a lot of time I just take caution and throw it to the wind, right? I, I'm not walking cautiously. And here there's this encouragement from, from the Apostle Paul saying, I'm encouraging you that you would walk cautiously. Because as you go through this life, there is a real threat to you. There is a real enemy that wants to destroy your life. See then that you walk cautiously, not as fools, but as wise. I wonder how many things in my life that I'm wise about, but my spiritual walk's not necessarily one of them. You know, we'll get smart with our health. We'll be cautious about our health. Well, sometimes we can be more cautious about what we put into our body and we're aware of, you know, the things that we're putting in there, but not spiritually. We can be more cautious about our finances than we are about our spiritual life. And Paul is saying, I want you to be cautious of your spiritual life and to don't, not be stupid about it, but be smart. And then he says, I want you redeeming the time because the days are evil. Don't waste these moments. Be very aware of what's going on because the days are evil. In other words, there's not a whole lot of time left. And the time that you have left here, we should be producing fruit. Therefore, do not be unwise. That's just a nice way of saying, don't be dumb. But understand what the will of the Lord is. I think we know what the will of the Lord is, right? That we produce fruit. That we produce. That's what he put us on this planet to do, is to produce. So we understand what the will of the Lord is. And then he goes on to say, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So what he's saying is, don't, don't be drunk with wine in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, our brains, we typically uh, like to focus on the negative and not on the positive. And so when we hear that, the only thing we hear is, you ain't supposed to get drunk. And I want you to understand is that not getting drunk is not the message that Paul's trying to convey here. He's using this in a very great description of what he wants to see happen in your life. Because the thing that Paul is saying is, I want you to do the will of God, which is to bear fruit. I want you to produce fruit. And he is about to unfold how it is that we produce fruit. He says, I don't want you to become, you know, I don't want you to become drunk wherein is excess with wine. I don't want you to overdo it with wine. And, and I, he's using a reference here that we're all familiar with. Anybody ever seen someone just go from the point of drinking to overdoing it? Yeah, we've all seen that. We know what that looks like, right? And, and how I many you know, that's not good. <laughs> like, like no, one, no one ever goes, ah, did it, <laughs> right? Everybody, no, nobody wants to go over the line, and yet he's saying this is, this is the, the example that he's using because what happens when you go over the line and you go excessive with this is that your life begins to unravel, and we've all seen what happens when a person uh, begins to have too much, and then it goes into excess, and then something happens where they become really drunk, and they stop being themselves, and something else takes over. I mean, you know, people have gotten in a lot of trouble from... from from excessive drinking, right? Made really bad choices, found themselves in places that they didn't mean to go, right? Because that, that what happens is that thing took over. You got so much in you that you stopped being you and your behaviors started to change. Paul says, instead of doing that, I want you to have the spirit so much in you that it takes over and your behavior start to change. So that when you would normally be grumpy and angry, you're so full of the Holy Spirit that you can no longer, you would normally want to be grumpy and angry, but you're not. You, you might normally want to come back and snap back at someone, but you're so full of the Holy Spirit that you don't. 
And so that's the reference that he's using here is, I want you to be that full of the Spirit that it changes and modifies your behavior. That you go through this life not being in control, but the Holy Spirit being in control of your life. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. And it's all about how much, right? How much are you putting in you? So here's what he's going to do. He's going to describe how to do that. This is how he stays full of the Spirit. This is how he, he stays completely full. Speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. One of the things that he does is singing and, and giving psalms and sharing the word and back and forth. You know, we were just talking about it this morning. Hodge is at work and he gets to share his testimony. Do you know what that did? Yeah, it was great for the other person, but it filled him up. Like he was feeling different. He had, there was a level of spiritualness on the inside of him that was filled up after having that conversation. When we get to know, together with one another and we share testimonies and we share things that God is doing and we celebrate those things that, man, man, you never believe this. God, you know, intervene in my life. And when you, when you share it, you, you're filled up. When you hear it, you're filled up. And when you get to help someone else uh, and share your testimony with someone else, you, you get filled up. And so these are those things. And then this morning, uh, uh, Deanna shared, hey, when I turned the song on, I got filled up, right? I was in this spot, and I just turned the radio on, and there it was, and I got filled up. Now, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. Not every song on the radio is, uh, is a spiritual song. Some of them just aren't. Right? And so I'm not saying that by automatically turning on uh, joy that you're automatically going to have filled up. But I'm telling you that there are songs out there that will fill you up. And there are moments that, that, that uh, you just know, I'm on empty. How can I quickly fix that? And sometimes I just got a little playlist that I go to. It's like, I, I need to get out of the darkness. I need to get filled. And so uh, that's definitely one of them. And then sometimes there's just, God, I don't, I don't. I, I, I just need to sing a song to you. I don't even know what it is. And you just start singing to God. And so this is what the Apostle Paul is describing here. These are the ways that he continues to uh, make sure that he stays full of the Holy Spirit in his heart. And then he goes on to say also, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The other thing that he does to fill himself up is that he continues to thank God for all things. He continues to thank God in the midst of all things. No matter what he was going through, I can find this opportunity. So this is why we talk about this a lot. Because how I many you know when you're grateful about something, you get more filled up. You get fuller and fuller on the inside as we're grateful. Giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's, here's another one. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Well, this one doesn't sound near as fun as the other ones. I want to keep this in a full context. This is a letter that Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus. He's saying, I am, I am asking you to walk cautiously because you're, just, you're living in some dangerous times and that there is an enemy that wants to destroy you and he wants to steal from you and he wants to kill you and just wreck your life. And I don't want to see that happen to any of you, but I know that there is an enemy out there and I am begging you to walk cautiously, to be aware of this fact that there is an enemy that is trying to mess you up. And it's the kind of enemy that you think everything's going great. You think everything's cool. Man, everything's great. All these things are happening great. Everything's cool. And then the next thing you know, you're like, wow, how did this happen? That's the kind of enemy that we are dealing with. And so as Paul's writing this letter, he's saying, I want you to stay filled up. I want you to stay so full of the Holy Spirit. But I need to tell you, this is how this enemy attacks. Submit to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and also Christ is the head of the church. 
He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. I mean, you know, this is an uncomfortable topic in our culture. Woo! What? <laughs> It's not talked about anymore. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that he should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh, and of his bones. And it's for this reason that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so Paul is identifying target areas of the enemy. You know, I always thought that when the devil was going to come, he's going to try to steal my money and steal my health and take things away from me. And that's not his plan at all. His plan is not to take your money. His plan is not to make you broke. Because I'm going to be honest with you. That doesn't ruin your life. In fact, that can make you closer to God. That could actually strengthen your life. And so sometimes we think our enemy is trying to take this from us or take that, take stuff from us. And that's not at all what the enemy's plan is. Paul goes right into this. He says, you want to know what the enemy's trying to do to you? Here's where you need to strengthen things because this is where the enemy is trying to attack you. You need to submit to one another. And wives, submit to your husbands. And husbands, love your wives and be like Christ was to the church to where you'd lay down your life and you'd be a sacrifice. Because these are the areas where the enemy is trying to get to you. He then goes on to not only talk about the relationship between the husband and the wife, but he then goes and talks about the relationship between the children and their parents and the parents and their children and how parents should, uh, uh, children should obey their parents and they should respect their parents. And then how parents should not provoke their children, but they should bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. And he, goes and, and he goes on then to talk about how, we should, uh, how bosses should treat their employees and how employees should treat their bosses and how they should do all of their work as unto the Lord. Because these are the things where the enemy wants to attack you is not in stealing your stuff, it's not in stealing your money, and not in stealing your health, but what the enemy wants to do is to destroy your relationships. That's the plan, baby. That's the whole thing. That's what he's after. If he can break you, listen to what Jesus told Peter. The, the devil has this, he wants you, and his goal is to sift you like wheat. He wants to break you apart from all of your brothers. He wants to take you and the other disciples and just destroy you and to tear you apart. But I prayed that your faith would not fail you and that after you're converted, what would you do? Strengthen your brothers. Because the one thing that the devil wants to do in your life is to destroy all the relationships because the one thing that produces fruit in your life is relationships. The devil is not trying to execute you. He's not trying to take you off of this earth. He's not trying to steal your money. He wants to destroy your relationships so that you live a life on this planet without fruit. That you live an unfruitful life. That you, you know, the devil doesn't even mind you being happy. He'll allow you to have some stuff that you want as long as it destroys relationships in your life. 
because that's what he wants to do. This whole admonishing is about relationships in your life. This is where the enemy wants to attack. He wants to destroy marriages. He wants to destroy parents' and children's relationships. He wants to cause a wedge between brothers and sisters. He wants to cause a wedge between brothers and sisters in Christ. His goal is to destroy the relationships that exist within our community. Listen to this. Verse 10, finally, my brethren... Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, and against rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. I mean, you've heard that before. That's a pretty popular passage. I I know that God wants to change me from the inside out. And what God wants from us is our heart. And I also know that the devil wants the same thing. And that he also wants to have control of my heart. And a lot of times we're, we're looking at physical wickedness, and this is actually talking about spiritual wickedness. Because the wickedness that destroys us is spiritual wickedness. It's when your heart turns. It's when your heart turns towards evil. It's when your heart turns towards selfishness. It's when you start to choose yourself over your own relationships. He says, our fight is not against flesh and blood. You know, a lot of things that we keep fighting in this life, we keep fighting them physically, and that's not where the fight is. And that's what the devil wants you to think. The devil really does want you to think that this is all about physical stuff. This is about financial trouble. You know what? Financial trouble, that's not even real. It's not even a real thing. This isn't about financial trouble. This isn't about your health. This isn't about sickness. This this is about real life, which is spiritual things. Spiritual things are the things that matter. And there is an enemy of your soul. There is an enemy that is against your soul. And so this fight that we're doing is a spiritual thing. And he says, I want you to take up the whole armor of God, whereby you would be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand, we stand. And here's it. How many of you guys have heard this description of the uh, armor of God before? You've heard it like at nauseum, right? You've heard all about the, the, the armor of God. And I've, I've, I've you know, read this hundreds of times. But... Just going through this, I just had a little bit different of a perspective today as I looked at this as I looked at this enemy and I'm looking at this armor, I'm understanding that this armor that we've been given is the very armor that is specific to our enemy. You see what what I'm going to find here in this armor is that this uh, the, let's think about. Let's think about um, let's think about back in the day when we had people sword fighting and all that kind of stuff, right? And you had knights and all that kind of stuff, all right? What kind of gear did the knights have, right? They had, and they had it like here, right? Because um, what would happen is is that somebody was trying to shoot an arrow or stab them, and so the the defensive mechanism and the gear that they had was designed based on where they were going to be attacked. And they had helmets because somebody was going to try to take an axe and hit them in the head with it or a sword or whatever, right? Oh, 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 oh. I don't know why. I love those kind of movies. 
so they'd have a helmet because they knew somebody was going to try to attack them in their skull. So the actual de designing of the helmet was because that's where the enemy was going to attack. So the helmet told me that there was an enemy who was trying to attack that. So as we look at this armor, we need to, here's what we need to understand about the armor, is that the reason why you're given this armor is because these are the areas in which the enemy wants to attack you. Verse 14, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. Tactic number one of the enemy is lies. And this is why we're girded with truth, because the, the, the enemy's tactic is deception and lies, to get you to believe things that are not true, to try to convince you of things that are not true. For starters, that you even have an enemy who's trying to destroy you. What a lie. What a lie to think that you're going through this life and there's not an enemy that's trying to destroy you. Do you know that if, um, I love talking to Eric because the Eric, Eric's like, man, I went to the gas station today and this lady in front of me was, you know, she was buying uh, lottery tickets and scratching them off and then buying new ones and I'm waiting in line and she's buying, you know, this and that and she's doing her grocery shopping at the Quick Mart. Quick Mart. We need to be in and out. This is a quick mark, right? And he's like, and really, I just wanted to like, you know, I just wanted to tell her, like, stop doing this. But then I realized, like, this is the enemy just trying to get me going. It's trying to mess me up. And people hear that and they're like, please. <laughs> That's not, <laughs> it's just because she was, you know, this is what she does. Okay. That's fine, you can believe that. But that's why the Bible keeps saying, don't be stupid. Don't be dumb. Don't look at these things that the enemy is attacking you and go, that's not an enemy, that's just life. The enemy is not trying to hurt me, that's just life. Things happen, bad things happen, good things happen, who knows. And to try to walk through this life as though there wasn't an enemy who was really trying to get to you. You know, and, and, and again, I don't want to like overdo it and say that everything that's happening is an attack of the enemy until we get super weird with it. But it's also super foolish to think that you're going through this life and there isn't an enemy who's trying to mess you up. And I'd say it's more of an attack of the enemy that he's trying to push, press your buttons than it is to take money from you. I think it's more of an attack of the enemy to try to destroy relationships in your life than it is to put sickness on you. Because the enemy is trying to destroy relationships in your life. And so one of the things he uses is deception. I mean, think about that. I, I, I think that most of the church lives their life as though the devil didn't even exist. As though there weren't a real enemy to fight. And then having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Do you know why he tells you to put on the breastplate of righteousness? Because the devil wants you to put on a breastplate of false righteousness. Where you try to make it up yourself. Where you don't take on God's righteousness, but you try to put on your own righteousness. And you try to be a good person. And you try to do good deeds. And then you tell everybody how good of a person you are and how you do good deeds. And that's your own righteousness to where you try to make God happy by all the things that you're doing. And I'm going to go the extra mile for you, God, because I'm your kid. It does not work that way. You are not going the extra mile for him. He went the extra mile for you. I mean, the stuff that I do for God is like crumbs falling off of a table. Like, I'm not going the extra mile for God anywhere near it the way that he went the extra mile for me. So I'm not doing anything for him. He's done everything for me. The only things that I've left to do are things out of a grateful heart just saying thanks. Not because I'm trying to earn you know what? The devil wants to get you in a place where you're trying to earn. You know why? Because if he can get you into a place where you're trying to earn, you'll be stuck there for the rest of your life. And if you're trying to earn righteousness, that tells me you don't have it. 
The difference is, is I have it. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to be a good guy to get it. I have it because Jesus gave it to me. So I put on my breastplate of righteousness. I don't let the devil rob righteousness from me. I don't allow the devil to say, you know what? You haven't been a good enough person. You need to go do this to be a better person. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. You know what? I've done that before. And it turned, into, turned me into an egotistical little snotty brat who thought he was a good person. And you, 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 you guys have been around people who really think they're good people. They make you feel like crap. That's not at all what we're here to do. Look, I know I'm, I'm a despicable character. I get that. That's why I have his righteousness and not my own. Having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I love that this is described as being a gospel of peace because here's a tactic of the enemy. It's to turn this into a gospel of division. Hmm. He's given you a gospel of peace because the devil wants you to have a gospel of division to where this book becomes very divisive in your life and to, and to where you have a division in many relationships who are brothers and sisters in Christ all over technicalities in this book. Well, I think it's this. Well, I think it's that. Well, then you just go over there and think that. And we'll go over here and think this. And we have all these divisions in it. And, and Paul describes this as being a gospel of peace, not a gospel of division. It's one of the things I love about uh, the, the, the group of men that we've had in this church since the beginning, the, the guys that have been here, we all have disagreements about things in here. And it's so fun because we just have the disagreements and we literally go, I don't know, I think it could be this. And, and then the other person goes, I don't know, I think it could be this. And then we go, huh. Right? It's just like, I don't know, man. I'm not like, you know, I, 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 I could be wrong. Huh. All right. And we literally walk away going, huh, yeah, maybe. Because it's a gospel of peace. Because me being right or you being right doesn't trump our relationship. Most important thing is that we walk away from this still brothers. And we both know how much we don't know. Like, we don't know a lot of stuff, so it's very possible. We've been wrong about so many things. This is a gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. The fiery darts of the wicked one. The countermeasure to the fiery darts is a shield of faith. Faith means trust. I believe, I trust you. And so the fiery darts that, are being, that you're being bombarded with in your life are all designed for you to not trust God. It's all designed for you to not trust him. For you to, to, for you to, to, to break down the trust that's in your life, for, for the things that he said, for you not to put trust in those. It's just like what happened with the disciples when Jesus died on the cross. What happened? They all broke apart and they had no trust. Right? That was the plan of the enemy, was to break them apart and to isolate them, turn them on each other, and it broke up trust to where when Jesus came back, they literally didn't believe it. Imagine how close they were with Jesus, how many times Jesus says, by the way, I am coming back. Huge mountains of evidence to the apostles that describe how Jesus would come back and he showed them signs that he would come back. He gave them clues, he gave them hints. He raised, mom I mean, like a week before, he literally raised Lazarus from the dead and said, I am the resurrection, here's how it works. Even though someone's dead, I can bring them back to life. Here's how it works. He gave the apostles all these clues and the devil's plan was to get them to a point where they did not trust in the very words of Jesus to the point where a week later, Jesus comes back and he's like, hey, it's me. And they're like, I doubt it. To where, to where the women go, guys, we saw Jesus. And they're like, she's lying. Like, dude, why, why would she lie? I don't know. 
Well, there's no way. To where all the other, the 10 apostles all saw Jesus and they go, Thomas, we all met with Jesus. And he's like, you're all in this together. You're all, I'm not going to believe it till I see it with my own eyes. I think all of my brothers and everybody in this whole world is lying to me. That's how much distrust can be in our hearts and us not even know it. That's how much distrust can be in us and we don't even know it. So we put on the shield of faith. We hold the shield of faith that says we're going to trust. This is God's given us trust. That in all these turbulent times, understanding the thing that the devil's trying to rob from us is trust. And by simply trusting, by simply trusting, we can quench the plan of the enemy. We can thwart the plan of the enemy and take the helmet of salvation. You realize the thing that the devil wants to take from you. What does that word salvation mean? Saved. What else? Rescued. What else? Set free. Set free. Do you know that the devil wants to steal your freedom? He said, I'm going to give you a helmet of salvation so that no matter what that enemy tries to do, that you know you're free. No matter how many times he tries to put you back into that cell and tell you that you're, you're bound to this and that you're a prisoner, do you realize that much of the church lives lives as prisoners and they've already been set free? I mean, you know how discouraging that is to, to have paid a price for someone to get out of jail and then they just sit there because they're like, oh, I think I'm still I think I'm still bound. I think I'm still uh, in the cell. Why? Because that's the plan of the enemy. And that's why he gave us the helmet of salvation that says, listen, you're free. You're saved. You've been rescued. You've been freed. There's no taking that back. Don't. These are the things that he's saying. Don't let the devil steal this from your life. Don't let the enemy take these things from you. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the very word of God. He also gave us the sword of the Spirit, the very words of, the God, of God. I love that he describes it as the sword of the Spirit. Because what the devil wants to do is to turn this into just a book. And how many know that he's been successful at that? Here's, here's the words. Here it is. Here's what they mean. And it becomes just another book. But this book is not just any other book. It is spirit and it is life. This is a book that is full of spirit and it is full of life. The, this is a kind of book that you can open it up and you can connect with the creator of the known world. That the very spirit of God connects with your spirit and teaches you things that you would not have seen before. And so one of the tactics of the enemy is that he's just going to turn this into another book. And that you could just open it up and read it and go, I don't know, I don't get it. Oh, apparently I'm not supposed to get drunk. Well, apparently I'm not supposed to do this, this, and that. And all of a sudden we turn this into a book of rules and we're just reading it like it's just these, you know, uh, stories and, and facts and events that happen. And that's not what it is. It is a book of life and it is a book of spirit. And you can connect with the Holy Spirit and it comes alive to you and he teaches you things about your life and how you change, and how, who you are to become. And it tells you who God is, and it tells you who you are. Or, we can just let the enemy have his way, and it becomes another book. Or we can just let the enemy have his way, and we can stay bound to sin. Or we can just let the enemy have his way, and we doubt God. We can let the enemy have his way and turn this into a gospel of division. We can let the enemy have his way and we pursue self-righteousness instead of God's righteousness. 
we can let the enemy have his way and keep buying into the lie that there isn't an enemy. I'm going to be brutally honest with you. There's an enemy to our souls that wants to destroy us. And I can't help but feel like he's been winning. I think there's an enemy that wants to destroy our relationships. There's an enemy that wants to keep us distant. There's an enemy that wants to keep us separate. There's an enemy that wants to keep us in bondage. There's an enemy that wants to keep us in the dark and to keep us deceived. And because we don't address him, and because we sweep it under the rug, and because we try to explain it away, the enemy, and the enemy keeps dominating us. And we keep allowing ourselves to be divided over things, and we keep allowing these things to happen. But that's not God's plan for us. And God said, here's the cool thing. At any point in time, you can recognize this and suit up and put your armor on. And prepare yourself for a battle. And go through this life walking cautiously, knowing that there's an enemy who's trying to steal from you. But here's what I want you to know. The fact that the enemy is trying to steal from you means that you have something of value. The fact that there's an enemy trying to steal from you means that there are things in you that are incredibly valuable. And that there is an enormous amount of potential inside each and every one of us to produce an enormous amount of fruit and do a tremendous amount of good for the kingdom of heaven that the enemy wants to steal. He's only after you because you have great value within you. He's only after you because there's a ton of potential. And I just look at my own life and I wonder how many more people like me have been robbed of potential because the enemy is deceitfully and subtly sneaking in and robbing us blind. And I think, well, I got my health. Financially, I'm set. The enemy's not robbing me. Don't be stupid. That's not what he's after. He wants to tear you apart, break you down, isolate you, disconnect you, and have you have weak relationships so that you don't produce fruit, so that you spend as much time on this planet not producing the good works of God, so that you spend your whole time on this planet living selfishly and not producing the fruits that God created you to, to produce in this life. So suit up, put on your armor. And know that as you walk through this life, there is an enemy. But that enemy is not more powerful than what's in you. Because greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. You're equipped. You just have to be smart. You just have to walk cautiously. You just have to know that there's a real enemy who really wants to destroy you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word this morning. God, we thank you for truth. We thank you for your insight. We thank you for your spirit that teaches us and causes us to know all things. We thank you for uh, giving us a mirror to put in front of our face. God, I thank you that you continue to enlighten us and that you give us hope. And that you give us a, a, a future, a better tomorrow. And God, that you are full of grace and mercy. And that you have surrounded us with your mercy and with your grace. And that we, cannot un, we can't outrun your love and we cannot escape your grace. God, I thank you so much for what you've done for us. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.